Today's conversation is one of the most important interviews I've ever done. It's with Vincent Deloard, a macro analyst who more than anyone I know has nailed, absolutely nailed the inflation call. He is the original inflationista and he has been sounding the alarm bells at a time when people were worried about deflation. And let me just put this in context. When I first launched this podcast in the summer and fall of last year, the transitory narrative was still in full flush, the thinking that inflation would moderate heavily and quickly, and that with each in uptick in CPI, in inflation, that would contain within itself the seeds of its own destruction, so to speak, because it would destroy consumer demand. Uh, well, I went to the store yesterday and I bought some deodorant for $10. So I'm pretty sure we can say that that so far has not has not been accurate. Well, what is next? Or before we talk about what's next, I, I just wanna say, why that's so important to financial markets is that because there is this epic mismatch between the price of money and the price of things, and central banks were behind the curve, so to speak, they have had to scramble, and I mean run as fast as they can to catch up with, with this mess. I mean, just today, we had uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell speak to the Senate Banking Committee, and uh, senators were lambasting him and saying, you know, one, one senator is saying, inflation is hitting my people so hard, they're coughing up bones. So this, the central banks are taking this enormously seriously, especially in the U.S., and you have seen a huge surge, not only in, in rates, but in forward rates. Uh, and so that is the second theme. The first theme I think of in my podcast uh, is inflation. And I attribute that to Vincent Delaware, who I'm very grateful to have back who you'll be hearing from shortly. The second theme is forward guidance. Uh, and central banks have had to do a lot of that, especially the Fed, to catch up. This is so important because th the asset allocation that, that so many folks had made to unprofitable technology stocks, to just stocks in general and bonds, uh, long duration, stuff like that, it all works so well in the deflationary, disinflationary world we all know and love the world where inflation is you know 1.8%, 1.6%, 2.1%, oh wow. But I mean 8.6%, these sorts of investments no longer make sense. And it's kind of game over for those these speculative uh, investments, as well as the price of uh, let's call them blue chips like Apple, you know, Apple. It's maybe not a you know a 35 price to earnings ratio in general. So so Vincent nailed this. He was completely right. What does he think now? I'll, I'll just give a quick summary because uh, his analysis is quite complicated. Uh, his, his new sort of thesis is that inflation will remain stubbornly high, but there'll be a corporate recession. Uh, there'll be a recession in corporate profits, but not necessarily in the labor market. So the actual economy will be shaky, but not disastrous. Whereas in financial assets, that's where the pain will continue to be. And as Vincent says, when it comes to the bear market in risk assets, we are only at the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. Um, so please, it's a long interview. There's a reason it's a long interview. Uh, please, if you can, stay till the end because Vincent shares several idiosyncratic ideas he has, such as uh, going long the yen and short the Nikkei uh, to try and uh, uh, front run a short squeeze in the Nikkei, which if you think about it, is exactly the opposite of what every single you know smart macro person is trying to be doing now. Um, and then also, uh, I also talk a little bit about my own personal investment journey, just a little bit at the very end, which I don't think I've ever done on this podcast or ever. So, uh, yeah, please make sure to stay till the very end. Uh, it is over an hour, well over an hour. Uh, subscribe to the Blockworks Macro YouTube channel, subscribe to the Blockworks Crypto YouTube channel, subscribe to the Forward Guidance podcast on the Apple podcast app and Spotify. Please leave some stars, please, hopefully five stars please leave a review. It really does make a difference. Uh, uh, thanks so much. Let's get to, into the interview. Today's episode is brought to you by Bit.com. You'll be hearing more about them later on in today's interview, which begins right now. Vincent, I'm so happy to have you back. Since you, we did our interview early on in Forward Guidance history, I think one of our first interviews in November of last year, you were projecting that the inflation train was just getting started and that it would be you know, a sort of a genera generational shift uh, that would be reflationary for wages and prices, but incredibly deflationary for asset prices, for bonds, risk premia. And uh, you know, 
Vincent, I don't know anyone on on the street, any investor, anyone I talk to who has whose whose inflation call was as strong and as early as you. I think you are the the ultimate inflationista. So my first question for you is what does it feel like to have been this right? Are you kind of shocked at how right you've become? And you know, what are you kind of are, are you are does it make you happy or does it make you sad because uh, you know so much you know so much pain is is going through you know it's are, are you like if if you if we're in the big short are you Ryan Gosling where you're in the bathroom being like I'm jacked to the tits or are you more like Brad Pitt where you're like hey guys you know people are going to lose their homes wow uh, well first of all thank you for for the kind words and um, you know thank you for for also providing a platform for voices such as myself, where I, I feel we've been um, kind of left out uh, for a long time. This was not the popular opinion. So um, it's good that we got a chance to to record the calls uh, on inflation. Um, as far as uh, how I feel, I mean, it's there's a little bit of a Cassandra syndrome, you know, Cassandra was this uh, uh, Trojan princess who uh, could see the fall of Troy, but could not do anything about it. So it's obviously it's mixed feelings kind of Brad Pitt in the big short, uh, where, um, I mean, I'm happy that obviously it's always better to be right about markets and to be wrong, but, uh, the consequences of, of secular inflation are, um, very nasty for, for, for financial markets and for asset owners. I think one idea that, that we want to communicate from this interview is, is the view that this is not over. Uh, this is the first leg of a very long process. Um, we have the technical definition of a bear market, but in some way it's the, e we had the easy part. The first 20% is the easy 20%. <laughs> My view is that there is another 20% leg that will come. And, and that, that is when the real pain is going to be felt. Uh, my guess is that it's going to take place in September, October, or, although it may be earlier, we'll see how market conditions are. Uh, but, um, it's not over. We still have to work through these, these profit issues. Uh, we still have to work through um, the fact that I don't think the terminal rate is high enough. Um, and that, yeah, it's going to be a long, uh, draw, uh, drawn out process. And on a positive note, is I think it's a healthy process. And, and that, that's what I would stress where, where we started on the conversation is the, the view that uh, it's the bitter medicine that we need. Now we feel the bitter taste, but what's happening behind the, the, the scenery is that the economy is trying to right itself. It's trying to fix the um, extremes uh, that we've we've gone for four years in one direction. You know, low rates, lower inflation, higher profits, higher inequalities, and I think we've reached a breaking point. And we are trying to move in the other direction. As we move in the other directions, we are breaking things. Things have started to break. They will keep breaking, but something better will come out of it. So I would be, you know, I am very bearish now. I think I will be, depending on where things are, but 2024, 2025, I'd be very bullish if, if everything plays out the way I expect. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, the bear market has begun. I think we are at the end of the beginning, but we are nowhere close to the beginning of the end. Now, one part about my inflation call where I think I am somewhat um, different from um, the mainstream is that I do think that over time, this is a good thing. This is an adjustment that was needed. But if we, if we take a very long-term perspective on, on the great inflation of the 2020s, I think it will reset uh, many things uh, in terms of generation, in terms of, uh, of asset prices, in terms of inequalities, in terms of economic growth. Um, so I, I kind of see inflation as a a bitter, bitter medicine. And, and now we, we have the bitter taste, uh, but I do think that in, in 10 years we'll be in a much better place in large part because of the inflation we're experiencing today. And Vincent, why do you say inflation is a good thing? And also does saying inflation is a good thing? Does that make several assumptions about the sort of flavor of inflation? In other words, it's wage driven rather than the price of oil going up, you know, and inflation's at 10%, but uh, wage growth is only at four percent, so people are getting squeezed by six, by six percent in in real terms. Uh, would that that that's not good inflation? But you 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 the inf good inflation that you imagine is wage driven, right? Yes, correct. And and I think that's what it is going to be. I mean, at some point, so albeit not now, I still think the oil market is very tight. And I mean, I I hope obviously oil prices will drop, but I'm I'm not that convinced that they will. 
but at some point they will. I mean, you know, you have like 30, 40% year over year inflation energy price. I mean, we can't keep going like that. Um, and you can see it already in the, comp- in the composition of the CPI, right? I mean, back last year when we had the whole transitory thing, you could more or less still kind of 70% of, this, uh, of these uh, sub-indices uh, are rising by more than 6% year over year. So it's really widespread. It's it's everywhere. Yes, oil is a big one, but at this point, you know, it's it's really become a kind of a structural phenomenon. And if you look at the 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 rate of change, the second derivative, the momentum of inflation, is strongest in the stickiest part of the CPI. Uh, you look at the month over month number, which you know is I think where you want to focus right now. So because year over year, you you really get tells you about as much about now as it did last year, right? So the, I think the, the Fed is really looking at month for month number, and um, yeah, it showed that there is um, acceleration in wages, in services, in rents. Uh, so it is spreading, and I think in, in a couple of years, at some point, the the energy supply chain component uh, is going to roll over, and we'll be left with uh, actual wage growth. Uh, and also, the the other part to this is a, a ride down in the value of assets. Um, yes, I mean, I agree with you. Wages are not keeping pace with, with general price level, but at the same time, asset prices are, de- are deflating by, you know, if you look at the, six, uh, the S&P 500, 20% year over year. So the, the ratio that matters to me, which is the ratio of, of labor to capital, uh, because I think this is central to restoring um, lower inequalities in the U.S. And, and ensuring the transfer of assets between boomer and and millennial and Gen Zers, that ratio is going down fast. Uh, yes, because wages are rising by 6 7% nominally and asset prices are falling very rapidly. This is what you want to see. A, a lot of folks I, I talk to say that inflation is hitting low income folks the most because they are, you know, the, they have the least ability to pay uh, to, to pay for the, 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 the rising costs. Is that accurate? Because also, I think you know, folks who are wealthy who have a lot of assets, they've definitely been suffering because I mean, they can obviously afford it, but like you know, they invested in lots of stocks and stuff that's gone down a tremendous amount. Uh, so yeah, tell us your your sort of sounds like you're sort of saying that inflation is necessary for equalizing for for uh, moderating inequality, but uh, a lot of how how do you square against the the counterpoint that you know inflation hit. Uh, low-income folks the most? Well, so on, on the low-income side, I think the argument is really about, you know, um, food and gas, right? It's because the poorer you are, the higher the proportion of your income goes to uh, uh, food and, and, and gas, which have been going up. So I don't deny that this is the case. However, you know, there's this uh, almost kind of sentimental... Um, it's almost like a mantra, oh, disproportionately affecting the insert, you know, victim group here uh, that is not necessarily um, supported by the data. Uh, if you look at um, um, the Atlanta Fed, they, they publish these uh, studies of wages in real time by, um, by income level, by education level, by um, uh, racial group. Uh, by type of work, and you'll see that the fastest uh, growth is for the, for lack of a better word, weaker categories. Hourly workers are, wages are rising more for hourly than non-hourly, uh, rising more for the low educated than the highly educated, rising more for non, non-white non versus white, um, low income versus high income. This is where the squeeze is. I mean, there is, we have a very tight labor market in general, but it's it's more it's tighter for jobs like like truck drivers or waiters uh, or nurses uh, than it is for financial analysts or um, you know kind of the product managers at big tech companies which are probably getting squeezed right now. Um, so it is happening be- behind the surface. Uh, another thing I point about inflation and inequalities is inflation were the lowest in the U.S in 1979 after the great inflation. Uh, so there can be a scenario where inflation is actually um, helping uh, with inequalities 
uh, and in large part it is because uh, inflation rises on the value of assets. So it makes it easier for people who work to acquire houses, stocks, bonds, um, and and you know this is a welcome trend. I mean, we've we've come from forty years of of wealth concentration, where you know margins have gone up. Uh, asset prices have gone up and by and large wages are stagnated. So this is unfolding and, and taking the other direction. Right. And I think just to, just to clarify for the audience, I think the key is key assumption you are making uh, is it, it, it depends on the marginal propensity to spend. So for, you know, I think a lot of people would say, Oh, but uh, uh, Vincent look at the uh, real wages, they're going down. So, uh, in real terms, you know, people are getting this as a as a raise, but they're getting this as inflation. Uh, for folks who are listening, I'm I'm you know, doing this with my hands. Um, but I think it depends upon the cohorts. Like if you give Bill Gates a hundred dollars, that hundred dollars is not going to go into the economy, you know. But if you give if you, if, if uh, folks who are making low income, they have a much higher propensity to spend. So that is the inflationary engine. Would I be correct in saying that that's an assumption you're making? Correct. And I mean, it's, it's not an assumption. I think it's born by the data. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like I said, wage growth is, is faster uh, for low income hourly position than it is for, uh, you know, the HR manager at a Fortune 100 company. Uh, so, um, yes. And, and I think that also speaks to the uh, the folly of, of monetary policy uh, in the past decade. I think it was 2009, there was the Ben Bernanke wealth effect speech, right? Where which if, if you want to take a date for, uh, you know, when did all this start, I would maybe put it there or the bailout of LTCM in the 1980s, 1988, but that kind of Fed put idea, the idea that the Fed had a, um, a duty to preserve asset prices because if asset prices are high, then rich people have money. And when rich people have money, they spend and eventually that, you know, that will help them achieve the inflation objective at, meaning at the time it was too low, right? And we saw that did not work, right? I mean, we, we've done a decade of wealth effect and precisely uh, playing along the uh, the, out, the the scenario described that you give Bill Gates more money, that doesn't change all that much, right? Because, you know, his, prop, his uh, propensity to consume is, is very, very, very low. So if he gets more money, he will buy more assets. So by doing 10 years of wealth effect, we've inflated asset prices, not real economy prices, because by and large, the money was going to, to folks who were buyers of assets. Now, today, we have the exact opposite phenomenon, which is why it's going to be very hard to get some real disinflation, because we have this very high income growth at the low end, which may or may not keep up with, with inflation. Uh, but still, you know, uh, it's all going to consumption. And then the the, the squeeze is happening for the, the asset owning class. But again, um, you know, if, if the value of, you know, uh, um, Facebook goes down by 50% the way it has, uh, the consumption of Mark Zuckerberg is, is not going to move. It's just going, what's going to change in how many ass, how many companies Facebook can acquire using its stock as a currency, um, or how many assets will be bought by the, you know, the Zuckerberg family office. So we're deflating asset prices, but it's very hard that the wealth effect is a very improper tool to target inflation. And it's very unfortunate that we've come to realize, to, sorry, to rely so much on, on the wealth effect. And it means that, you know, if if we are trying, which, I, which is my understanding of what the Fed is doing when he says, you know, financing conditions are too easy, what they really mean is stock prices are too high. Using the stock market to uh, control inflation is, is a very indirect way, and it is going to make the disinflationary process very, very slow. Uh, the same way that, you know, trying to inflate an asset price bubble in order to inflate real economy prices took more than 15 years. And maybe, I mean, I think inflation came for a reason that had nothing to do with that. So the, the Fed's reliance on the wealth effect, which is effectively has become its only tool, means that monetary, monetary policy has become less uh, efficient than it was uh, when, um, you know, the, the main tool was the deposit rates, uh, and we had a, a much more direct impact on, on the economy. So the wealth effect is not an effective tool to generate demand, to generate growth and inflation. We know that. What about the reverse wealth effect, though? Because if Facebook, the value of the stock is, is destroyed 50%, yeah, it's not going to change, change Mark Zuckerberg's spending habits. But what about, let's say, you know, an uh, engineer who's you know in their mid-30s who was paid in stock and 
was on paper a millionaire, you know, a year ago. And now they're not. And now they're saying, hey, like, I want to actually, I want to be paid in cash. I don't want to be paid in something that's going down 50%. Uh, are they going to be spending less? Are, you know, I, I can imagine it, common sense would say yes. But what, what do you think? Yeah, no, it's it's a good point. Um, and I think you, you're going to start to see that in where I am in, in the Bay Area, right? You're going to see that in real estate prices. Uh, uh, clearly, there was this almost like a perpetual motion machine, right? Where the, the big tech companies would, would, would pay half of the salaries in, in stock. Uh, stock market would go up in large part because um, money was flowing into passive vehicles, which is buying the biggest stocks in the index. Uh, and, and, and then these, these uh, employees were making, uh, you know, huge comp packages, which they would then use to buy other assets, including tech stocks, crypto, real estate. Um, and then that was also quite good for, for the tech companies because they could print stocks. So if you look at a free cash flow, uh, at, at their free cash flow, it was amazing. Well, it was amazing because they paid their employee in stock, not, not, not cash. Uh, so I think all that is indeed unraveling. Um, and that will have an impact uh, locally, I would think. Um, but I, um, yeah, if, if you're talking like, you know, house prices in, in, in the Bay Area or second houses in Tahoe, I see that. If you're talking uh, crypto prices, I see that. If you're talking about the general price level, though, um, this is still a relatively small segment of the economy. This is, I don't think it's going to change a needle for, if you think about the oil market, you know, that's not going to change the fact that we have this kind of supply and demand imbalance in the oil market. Um or it's going to take a very, very long time. And, and I think we're just starting. I mean, you see in, in the Valley, I mean, yes, yeah, some small companies have announced uh, layoffs, like, you know, 20% across the board cuts. Uh, but that's kind of the, the weaker, you know, the, the, the big tech name still. I think there may be a couple hiring freeze, but we are very early in that process. Um, so, uh, and this is where the bulk, you know, of, of, of workers is, right? It's the, the big tech companies with so much hiring. We haven't even started the process. So yes, eventually it will work. Uh, but I, I, my concern about the way the market's been trading is this, um, the speed of the disinflation process is, is something that, that would be unprecedented by history. The view that after like two or three rate hikes, suddenly it's just going to roll over and it's going to roll over and fall below 2% very rapidly. So, so rapidly that we can contemplate rate cuts by February or March of 2023, which is what the euro dollar curve tells you. This is unprecedented in history. I mean, I, I don't think we've ever had um, you know, close to double digit inflation, and then we're, we're back on track uh, 12 months after. Yes, there is precedent for the Fed cutting that fast, such as uh, the, the Powell pivot in December 2018, but not during a period of, of inflation. Yeah, absolutely. The, the other thing, the other thing I mentioned is, I, I think cuts have a more immediate effect on uh, on demand or the real economy than, than, than hikes. And that's because of the uh, embedded option, the real estate market, and then also for corporations. Uh, so, you know, you, have, you, own a home, you own a home, rates go down, you refinance. So immediately you, you, you get this cash flow effect, oh, you, you pay less on your mortgage payment. Well, if rates go up, well, you, you don't do anything, right? You just wait and see. Uh, so it, it's, it's only until your mortgage recess that you get the effect on, on your personal finance. Same thing with corporation, right? I mean, if, if, if rates go up and you don't have a liquidity problem and you have a lot of cash, well, it really doesn't matter, right? Um, while on, conversely, when rates go down, you see this huge uh, refinancing boom, uh, massive issuance. So um, I think the economy is more sensitive to rates going down than it is to rates going up. Vincent, since we last spoke, there's been you know a tr tremendous carnage in the equity market, the S&P 500, officially in a bear market, over 20% drawdown. How would you attribute that to inflation? And importantly, what channels, what mechanisms would you say inflation is causing asset prices to deflate? Is it uh, risk premium? Is it going up? Is it that treasuries are going up? Is it that profits are going to go down because input costs are, are going up? You know, how would you sort of uh, attribute the, the various factors there? Well, for now, it's a discount rate channel, but I think it's going to move very rapidly to the, the margin channel. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a discount rate channel. Um, I mean, one to me, one of the most interesting um, development in the past month 
It's not so much the, the route in the equity market. I kind of expected that, but it's the uh, the rise of real yield. If you look at the yield on the ten-year tips, it's it's positive for the first time since COVID. It used to be um, you know minus one percent. It's probably around zero point five. So you get a hundred fifty basis point increase in real yield. Uh, so tips means you know inflation adjusted yield positive. Um, so that has to be fed. You know the way discount discount rates work, right? It's a uh, you know, you have your risk-free rate, you have your inflation adjustments, you have your your credit spread. Uh, so these building blocks, and they're all expanding at the same time. Uh, we have a very uh, duration-heavy economy, uh, a very duration-heavy stock market uh, that's dominated by, you know, big tech firms that have a very long cash flow profile. So we're very sensitive, probably more sensitive now than we were 40 years ago. Uh, so, and also the, the nature of convexity um, of, of asset prices, it, the closer you go to the zero, the closer it's it, it's asymptotic, right? You, you, I mean, if if you discount something at a zero, cash flow goes to goes to infinity, right? So we have a lot of interest rate sensitivity built in because rate were so low. It's not the same thing going from zero to two than it is going from eight to ten in terms of the effect on the asset prices. If you look at the the derivative, the first derivative, it's it's much steeper around the zero lower boundary. So that's that's where we've been. It's been mostly uh, discount rate, risk premium, as you pointed. I think the next story is going to be earnings. Um, now it's been somewhat hidden because the economy has been so, so strong. I mean, despite all the recession talk and the University of Michigan sentiment data, you know, we're still looking at double digit nominal growth in the economy, probably eight, 9% inflation, two, 3% real growth. Uh, so when the top line is growing that fast, even though costs are rising because of the built-in operating leverage, uh, earnings are okay. Like for, for Q2, I think we had, you know, four or 5% earnings growth, which in the grand scheme of things is, you know, is okay. But think of it, you know, you have the economy is growing by, you know, 15% nominally or 12 and the bottom line is growing by four. Uh, so what's going to happen next is the, I mean, even I, who I would say I am somewhat bullish on the economy compared to consensus, I, I acknowledge it's going to slow. Uh, so you get the operating leverage is going to start working the other around. Your, your, your top line is going to slow, but your cost, I mean, the cost of everything is going up. The cost of financing is going up very rapidly. We had the biggest interest rate shock in you know, four years, you know, two years ago from, you know, zero to three in six months. Uh, we have uh, very rapid wage growth. Uh, we have soaring uh, energy costs, uh, and then it's across pretty much every single commodity. So the squeeze on margin is going to be real at the time when the top line is going to slow. We are going to start seeing it in earnings. Uh, I would think Q3, Q4, um, which is the exact opposite of the consensus things. I mean, for now, we, we think earnings reaccelerate towards the end of the year, like we'll see six, seven, eight percent earnings growth, Q3, Q4. To me, that is a scenario for the second down leg of this bear market. Now we have the discount rate effect. The, the next down leg will be, oh, companies are under earning and, and, and yada, yada, disappointment. I mean, the combo of, I, I don't think a single example of positive earnings growth when you had at the same time a dollar shock, meaning the dollar is stronger, interest rates are higher, oil prices are higher. This is your classical, you know, recessionary combo or at least profit recessionary combo. Um, so that's, to me, that's that part needs to be played out. Right. So up until now, the drawdown in equity markets have been a, a hike in the discount rate, the, the rate at which future cash flows are discounted. But you think the next shoe to drop is going to be the few, the cash flows themselves in terms of, of profits. And, and by the way, that Discount rate is, is composed of the risk free rate, which is treasuries, which is going up that spiked tremendous amount because of inflation, as well as risk premium, which is sort of the the, the you know the odds that, that the market is assigning because it, it needs a certain amount of, uh, of of protection. You you said recession that we sort of have a perfect storm of uh, higher oil prices, higher dollar. That's recession. How are you thinking about the the odds that? the economy is going to continue to be in inflation or continue to be in recession. And then also you sort of compare it to uh, the Scylla and Charybdis where uh, Odysseus has to choose. Does he go to the whirlpool or does he go to the, the six headed monster? Which is which we you know is, is inflation Charybdis, which is, which is Scylla. And then which choice is, is the one that you think we're going to make? Yeah. So uh, it's funny you mentioned Charybdis and Scylla because in, 
you know, in, in common language, we, we think of it as, oh, two equally bad options. And I think this is how the, the market has been thinking about inflation and recession, right? Just like, um, and in the story, in the Odysseus, it's, it's the exact opposite. Uh, uh, Odysseus has a choice to make. If he goes by the whirlpool, he will lose his ship and all his man. Uh, all his man. I think that's Caribbean, I think. Yes. Uh, and then uh, if he goes next to the, the six-headed monster, he will lose only six men. So it's kind of like one of these more di- dilemma. Like, uh, uh, there is a right choice. Yes, uh, you know, save save one man, uh, kill one man to save five, or you know, um, yeah. So he makes the choice. He loses six men and, and keeps going. And so that's the lesson: is that you know, the, it's the exact opposite of what, what we think of when we think of Caribbean and Scylla. It's um, there was a right choice, and I think the the much greater peril is inflation, not recession. If anything, a recession would be, you know, some at some point would be bullish for asset prices, which which I think is what we're seeing earlier in May when we had this little bounce in the S&P 500 at the same time where we saw the, the, all the recession talks like, oh, okay, if hopefully the recession will kill the inflation and then we can look at a world in which the Fed starts easing again, kind of like the, the 2018 playbook basically. Uh, and this is a very reassuring narrative for markets because it's something that we've been accustomed to for 20 years and it's also something that you know would make us think like, okay, this is almost over. We've done 20%, but eventually this will normalize. Um, on the other hand, uh, inflation is is much more devastating to asset prices. Uh, if you look at the history of, of prior bear markets, the nastier ones have been the inflationary one. Um, I'm not on the recession call. I don't spend a lot of time uh, thinking about it. I think there's already a lot of economists that do that. And to some extent, it's kind of, to me, it's wasted time. I mean, you will know a recession two quarters in a year. The NBER will tell us when when it happens, but it's it doesn't strike me as that relevant. Um, what I can see is a profit recession. That's really what I was talking about. Is 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 a profit recession? That that is the first that is the first true drop. I think before we see it in the economy, we'll see it in profits, um, and then if and when we'll see when it happens. But what happens if you know companies will get squeezed? And because they are getting squeezed, they may announce big layoffs, and then eventually that may be recessionary. But to me, that's more of a story for end of 2023, maybe 2024. And again, the biggest driver for market is going to be how quickly the disinflation process takes place. The market still expects it to happen very, very quickly. And my expectation is I want. And the, 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 the issue for me is going to come in September, October, when we still have inflation, let's say 7.5% would be my guess by September, October, uh, we see profits turn negative. Uh, we see probably some of the market stress that we haven't seen yet. We haven't seen you know major hedge funds blowing up. We haven't seen investors pool money. If anything, we've seen a lot of dip buying, especially in you know, certain uh, actively managed ETFs. Um, this is the next rule drop. And you have you know typically um, bad seasonality in September, October. So we see this perfect storm. Um, there we I classified the, the, the prior 12 bear markets based on whether they were inflationary or recessionary or either or none or both. Uh, and you can see that for now we're tracking the inflationary ones, which makes sense, which are more brutal than the recessionary one. And, and the lines, whether there's just inflation or inflation and a recession doesn't change all that much, at least at the beginning. Uh, so for now, Again, the classification that matters is, is this going to be an inflationary bear market? My answer is yes. If it is an inflationary bear market, that means it lasts more than um, six months now and and 20%. Although looking at this chart, it's definitely not a bullish chart by any means, but it seems like the downside to some degree is capped. You know, the, the most that the green line, inflation and recession, is down is, is 25%, and we're at 20% now. So, you know, maybe according to this chart, if, if, if this chart is accurate, then like selling a 15% out of the money put spread would be a good trade. I'm not saying it is, to be clear. But, you know, do you think it's possible that this chart is is not bearish enough? Well, yeah, because it's it's an average, right? So you take it out of cases and you average mm-hmm. a line, and, you know, there were some fairly benign bear markets in it. So... Um, I don't think inflation is benign here. I mean, we have, you know, 8.5% inflation. So 
uh, it, it's being somewhat flattered by prior bear, inflationary bear markets where we didn't have that big of an inflation problem and also I would argue that big of a stock market bubble. For example, you get the, the bear market from the 70s there where, when valuations were very low to start with. So, um, you know, in, in the 70s, yeah, we, we had, you know, two or three bear markets. So that was, that was bad, but each of them was not huge in itself. Today's episode is brought to you by Bit.com, a leading cryptocurrency trading platform. From spot to futures to options trading and more, Bit.com has it all. So whether you're a seasoned investor or you're new to the game, you need to be on Bit.com. Bit.com has launched a zero taker fee option campaign until May 10th. To enroll, email VIP at Bit.com. That's Bit spelled B-I-T. So email VIP at Bit.com and tell them I sent you. Vincent, up until this point, the the biggest amount of pain that investors have felt have been in the unprofitable unprof- technology stocks, the electric vehicle companies, the electric plane companies, the asteroid mining SPACs, the sort of highly, highly <laughs> speculative stuff with, you know, they don't have any profit or in some cases they don't have any revenue. But uh, I, I, in your writing, you, you you say that you think the next leg that will be down will be the companies that are highly indebted in the in the Russell 2000 that can't afford their interest rate expense uh would tell us about what sort of companies these are and you know why do you think that the the sort of baton in this bear market will be passed from like let's say the arc stocks to uh, uh these sort of Russell junky companies yeah so on, on the speculative stuff i mean it's, um, selling exhaustion at some point which by the way i don't think we are there yet uh, I think there's still a lot of speculative money that is uh, invested, but it is deflating fast. I mean, you look at, you know, um, some of the names you mentioned, most of them are down like 80 to 90%. So if you think about the the share of the market cap that is occupied, uh, it's, it's, it's fallen a lot. I don't think we're done with the process, but I think the, you know, we've written them down quite a bit already. Um, so, you know, you want to focus on the emerging risk, not the, not the one that's behind you. Uh, to me, the, the 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 main risk is is corporate profits. I think that is that will be the focus for for the next quarter. And and we're not coming from a very good place. Um, you know, overall we have high profits, high margin, but in large part that is boosted by you know a handful of, of very large tech companies who um, whose profitability is somewhat overstated. Uh, because of the stock-based compensation thing we're talking about, uh, because of low rates, because of artificial stimulus in the economy, you, you pull that away and, and you have a picture that is a lot less healthy. Um, so the the way I look at it is I try to measure the amount of, of zombie companies. So zombie companies are companies which um, whose operating expense, which means like the, the most generous, you know, uh, sorry, operating profits, the most general, you know, you, you don't look at depreciation, you don't look at tax, you just focus on like, you know, the the easiest metric is not enough to cover your interest expense. And then I added also another condition that it don't have enough cash on hand to sustain 12 months of expenses. That's about 20% of the Russell 2000 index, which is in, in this position. And again, that's looking back at the past year when we had record low interest expense and a record high nominal GDP growth. So you only had 20% of the rest of 2000 and could not make any money in the circumstances. If you look at junk, junk bond yields, I mean, when I, on average last year, it was about 4%. Today, it's closer to eight. So you can't make the numbers work at four. How, what's going to happen when it moves to eight, especially if your top line starts to fall? Um, so, um, yeah, I think this is the... Um, this is the next two to drop is going to be this, this problem that we had with corporate leverage. Uh, the fact that, you know, the, the, I would assume the high yield market is going to remain closed, uh, or at least whatever prices will be at prices that these companies cannot afford. Um, so we will see the, the bankruptcy cycle, which has been suppressed for, for 10, 15 years. I mean, if you look at the chapter seven, chapter 11 filing in the U S it's, there's almost none. And the, you know, the line's been going down for, for 10 years. I mean, we suppressed bankruptcy. Uh, and it's not, you know, the structure of the economy hasn't changed. It's not like every, the quality of management has <laughs> increased in the past 20 years. I mean, it's just that we had abnormal liquidity, abnormally low rates, abnormally low spreads, and that has kept a lot of uneconomic supply, 
which I would argue is at least in the short term inflationary because you're going to have to remove. We, we kept a lot of production alive. Uh, if, if anything, if investors were subsidizing consumers for 10 years because of the Fed policies. And as we unwind that, the first effect I would think is going to be inflationary. Wow, I never thought of that. Yeah, it's, when I hear companies going bankrupt, I obviously assume it's deflationary. But you're saying if those companies don't exist, then they won't be there to produce the goods, and that will drive up the price of goods. Never thought about that. So, Vincent, you said that high, um, the, you think high yield credit spreads, you, high, the high yield credit markets will be frozen. What about the uh, financing, not of high, of credit, but of equity via IPOs and SPACs. You know, we've had a huge IPO bonanza. Let's let's call it an orgy, uh, Vincent. Uh, some you know, to the tune of you know five hundred billion dollars, well, much much bigger than the IPO bonanza in the, the late dot com bubble of, of ninety nine and two thousand. Uh, do you think that will stop? And also, what's going on with these SPACs, where you know everyone's redeeming their SPACs, like? You know, the BuzzFeed de-SPACs and, and 98% of the people who own the SPAC say, hey, give me my $10 back. I don't want to do the deal. Like, what, what, is, that going to, what is that lead going to lead to? The, the ones that the IPOs that did price and the SPAC that did merge, uh, by and large, didn't work. I mean, uh, if you compare the, if you look at the, the performance on the um, um, Renaissance IPO ETFs or uh, just look at the the Horrible. vast majority of these things, yes, like it's down like not, not 20, like 80, 90, you know. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I know some SPACs that, and I know some folks who shorted them, some some specific SPACs who they're literally down more than like Gazprom, the Russian stock that doesn't trade anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, and, and I think it speaks to the, um, I mean, the way I think of it is, you know, always we have a macroeconomic lens for me and then and the question of inflation. Um, I, again, I see, I see this whole um, 2020, 2021 um, IPO SPAC bubble as um, um, hoping for productivity miracle, basically. We, 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 you know, we had this... I mean, I never really believed in it, but like the, you know, the view that COVID was going to be uh, productivity positive, that we were at the, uh, what was the term? The exponential age. Uh, disruption was going to happen at a faster and faster rate and that we are going to, you know, finance companies that would disrupt everything, the way we eat, the way we work, the way we, we drive, the way we, and, and so forth. Uh, well, clearly that hasn't happened. I mean, what we've seen by and large is a good old fashioned bubble uh, where people bought assets thinking, you know, they bought a story and the story never turned out. Um, and and the way to think of it is that it's, again, a subsidy from uh, in the investor class to the consumer class. And I think that's one of the reasons prices have, have remained so low. Um, so there was the the actual dollar loss, which, which we're plotting here. And this is all the, you know, your millennial lifestyle company, you know, the, the DoorDash, the Ubers, the, uh, the Lyft, the WeWork, the Smile Direct, the Carvana, the Zillow, the Lemonade, the Blue Apron, like all these companies that were going to disrupt everything and, and, you know, and, oh, and they would grow into it, you know, uh, you know. Vincent, I've got two words for you to to steal from the great investor, uh, George Noble, game over. That's what I have to say when I look yes. at these charts. Game over, DoorDash. Game over, yes. Lyft. Game over, WeWork. Game over. Make money or it's over. But but the point is, so that there were two deflation assets. So there was the, the, the loss. So effectively, you know, they were selling you a dollar for 95 cents. So they were giving you a five cent subsidy, uh, which, you know, if you've taken an Uber lately, you've seen that this, this is being removed very rapidly. Or if you go yeah. on Airbnb, like, you, you know, the prices now are, are probably higher than hotels. Uh, so there's that reflation there. And then I think on a psychological level, there's also the, for all the economic companies, there was a fear of being disrupted that, that kind of had a disciplinary effect. Like, oh, uh, you know, some, some, some kid in the Valley is going to come up with an app is going to take my profit. So he created some price discipline and as we see now that this was really just a bubble and a waste of investor money. I think this, this discipline, um, disciplining of, uh, traditional economy company is going to go away as well. So again, removing that accommodation, I think in the first the first round effect is going to be de- so inflationary. Yes, and you know I really want to hone in on the point you made about productivity because you and me, you know, 
uh, the giant sort of Grim Reaper huge tractors that that folks use to collect you know tons of tons of wheat from the ground in 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 you know a matter of minutes. That is obviously way more productive than you and me sort of toiling in the fields and picking the wheat and the corn by ourselves. That is a huge increase in productivity. But DoorDash, uh, you ordering something over DoorDash and then me picking it up and delivering it to you. That's not more productive than you picking up yourself. It's just that you're paying me to do it. So it's it's just it's fundamentally non-productive. And these businesses uh, were born and thrived in an area of uh, in a, during an era of low cost of capital. And the cost of capital is raising. Well, uh, do, do, I mean, do you, can they can they survive in in an area of a higher cost of capital? Hey, I think the the stock market is telling you no, and and I think the way you summarized it was was brilliant. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's a different kind of innovation, right? I mean, the combustion engine is, you know, truly, you know, revolutionary or uh, cent uh, central heating, um, highways, uh, the kind of innovation from, you know, the post-war period. You had this broad-based effect on the economy that that lasted for for decades. Even the, uh, yeah, the computer I would, I would put in there, but yeah, if you look at a lot of the innovation, as you mentioned, it's it's you know I'll pay a guy to fetch me a sandwich, or even just the, and I do believe Amazon is fantastic, but like you know having some a, a truck bring me a tooth a toothbrush at you know two a.m. in the morning is not more a more economic a more efficient economic organization than than before. I mean, in some way, this you know a, a lot of the Silicon Valley was just that, like uh, it was predicated on cheap capital and cheap labor and arbitraging that. But that does not work when you have wages going up 8%. So, you know, DoorDash, Uber, Lyft, they, the, 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 their labor costs must be going up. And they, by the way, they've been pretending that as if they don't have employees, as if they're independent contractors, which they're, they're clearly not. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a crazy world. So, okay. So these stocks will continue to go down, Vincent. The, what, uh, the, Zombie companies in the Russell will continue to go down. Can you tell me what are the zombie companies? Because like four years ago, you know, the archetypical zombie company was an energy company, but now that energy company mm -hmm. has paid off all of its debt and is kind of doing pretty well. So, what is the modern day zombie company now in in June twentieth, twenty twenty two? Yeah, you make a good point, and, and that's something that boy that that that's quite positive for the U.S. is the um, one reason that junk spreads in the U.S. not rising as fast in Europe is because uh, a lot of the junk issuers, you know, where the shell companies, which now in a, in a complete reversal, um, if you look at the, you know, Bloomberg Barclays reports, the, um, the, the spreads X energy used to be, you know, oh, don't worry, it's just the energy sector, but the rest of the economy is fine, right? Now, now your uh, your X energy is actually higher than the index, meaning that, you know, energy companies get to borrow at a lower cost because they are uh, making more profits than God in the words of Joe Biden. Um, so, um, no, it, I would think it's mostly kind of traditional economy stuff, like, uh, you know, cable companies, not, not particularly good business operating in, not very well run, very competitive industries, very low margin, uh, and and now they're getting hit with uh, with rising costs, which by and large they can't do much about. You know, it's like okay, well your your electricity bill goes up. What do you do? I mean, you kind of have to pay at this point. Uh, wages are going up. I mean, you need your workers. Uh, so, no, it's 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 not energy, and it's not it's not mostly tech. It's just kind of mediocre old economy, like industrial communication, this type of stuff, like uh, basically, um, uh, you know, S&P 495, <laughs> you, you take out the thing and the big techs and that's... Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. Now, what about the S&P 5, the Apple, Google, uh, uh, um, you know, Facebook, st stuff like that? Because I always hear people say, oh, Apple is like a 70-year bond. It's like a 70-year bond. But if it really was like a 70-year bond, Apple would be down way, way more because TLT, yeah. the ETF, which has 20 to 30-year treasury bonds, is down, I don't know, 35%, probably more than that, uh, peak to trough. So, and Apple's down only 25%. So if it really was a 70-year bond, it would be down you know, at least 40% on the duration and probably more. And then as well, it would be down because of the, the, the risk premium going up. So why is Apple sort of the generals of the market, the Googles, the Facebooks, why have they, not Facebooks, but the Googles and the, uh, uh, the Apples, why have they proven resilient and you know, what's your outlook on them? 
Well, for Apple, I think it's a um, the, the the duration. It's a it's a fair of all the big tech stocks, probably the lowest duration one. Um, for a bunch of reasons, one the the high cash uh, on the balance sheet. So, I mean, cash has a duration of zero, right? So, um, there's a really good chunk of the market cap that's that's that has a zero duration. Uh, Apple pays a dividend. Apple's a large buyback. So, a buyback you can think of it as a you know, the way a, a zero coupon bond has a higher duration than a high coupon bond, right? Because a high coupon bond gives you your, your money back every every six months. Apple does that in a way with a buyback and, and the dividend. Um, and it was somewhat less overvalued than some of the um, big tech names. So I would think it's the that's why it's holding up because Apple is not a long duration stock, as you point out. So I would think the duration of Apple is probably that of the market. Makes sense. It's dropped about by the same amount as, as, as the overall market. Um, um, so, and then, I mean, the, the, the thing I would say about the, the big tech also is um, they, they will, they, there are some headwinds coming for them in terms of, um, you know, supply chain for, for Apple is a huge problem. Their, their reliance on China, the, the zero COVID, I mean, plenty of, of challenges, you know, rising input costs, uh, but they do have, they, they come from a very strong place, right? They have a lot of cash. Uh, they have near monopoly power. Um, they also have these extremely bloated workforces. I mean, one thing that really struck me in, in uh, you know, Silicon Valley in the past three, four years, it's just a, the insane amount of hiring that's been going on. I mean, just, I mean, people just can't even tell, say what they're doing, like entire department, like product managers. I don't know. I can't tell you how many, you know, Facebook product managers I've met. To this day, I still don't understand what they do. Uh, and most of them were hired in the past, you know, one to two years. And it's it's not the same profile. You know, early Google employee, yeah, it meant something. Like if, if you got, you know, if you got a job at Google at the time they IPO'd, like you were probably really, really smart and went through a gruesome process. And it's not the same kind of employee that have joined these big tech firms in the in the past two years. So they will have room to cut. Um, they will face some challenges, but you know, of, of course, of course, they will survive. Um, I think they will suffer a bit from this this kind of SPAC um, VC bubble burst. Um, I don't know if it's a good time to do a Chamath quote. I don't think this is ever a good time to to quote Chamath, but I'm going to go with it. Um, I don't know where he got that number, but it struck me. I think it was two years ago. He mentioned that, you know, 50 cents of every dollar that's raised uh, in VC capital ends up being spent on um, AWS servers, uh, Facebook ads, uh, Google AdWords. Uh, So I think some of their... um, And I don't know how he got the numbers. I don't don't even know whether you can measure that truly, but... um, but I think he's touching at least an important concept that a lot of the money that was raised uh, for IPOs, for VC, for SPACs ended up being spent on the big tech companies. And that's a transmission, that's a contagion channel from the, the, the segment of the market that's imploding to the top line, eventually the profits of the big tech firms. Um, so no, I'm not, um, I'm not bullish on them. Um, but I also, you know, believe that they have, you know, they are in a very, very, very strong position. So they can, they will not die from this. Vincent, what is your, let's say over the next year outlook on what US inflation will be, whether it's PCE or or CPI? I just want to throw a few forecasts at you, which is with the Fed's economic uh, projections that they recently released, they think, uh, you know, in 2023, PCE inflation will be down to 2.6%. And this year, it will be 5.2%. Uh, you posted a chart which shows that the uh, forward inflation CPI swap uh, for next year, 2023, will be something around 4.5%. Where are you? If, if we had to draw the, the Vincent Deluard forward curve of inflation, what would that look like? Because that's what I want to bet on, given that you've been so right. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, you know, uh, I think it's in the um, the second Wall Street movie. Um, there's this scene when the the uh, the young aspiring trader asked the, the Goldman Sachs partner, you know, what's your number? You know, the number where you quit, call it quits, and, and his answer is higher. Uh, that's kind of my answer on inflation. Um, I think it's it's still higher, higher than consensus. 
Uh, I, I do think, you know, all else equal, and that's a big if, because I think that's, by the way, one of property of the inflationary age is you get this kind of nonlinear reaction that you, you get more unexpected events. Like, you know, to, for example, I don't think Russia would invade Ukraine if there was not an inflation problem. Um, and we don't know what, what the next macro shock is going to happen, whether it's, a, you know, a revolution in Egypt or... A, major political instability in, in, in emerging markets. I mean, you see the, the political, you know, um, swings. We see, for example, Colombia uh, yesterday, uh, Peru before that, Chile before that. So I think you could see kind of some snowballing of inflation. Like I think that the last interview we did was called Inflation is Inflationary, and I, I believe that. Um, but that being said, all else equal, let's say we don't have any new macro shock. I kind of agree that inflation is going to fall. Um, but it's not going to fall very fast. And part of the reason it's not going to fall fast is because last summer was disinflationary. All prices went down last summer. So your base effect are going to work against you in the next, uh, for the, you know, the, the June, July and September, October CPI is what I call the plateau of death kind of worries me because right now your, your, your CPI is a tug of war between your, um, supply chain plus COVID plus energy where you do have disinflation because of base effect and then you kind of structural basket wages rents um services where you know you still have positive month over month momentum um what worries me is that in the immediate term in the next two to three months the disinflation coming from your energy plus supply chain plus COVID is going to slow uh, so inflation is going to remain you know uncomfortably high throughout the summer i think by september october we're above 7.5 which I think is going to be a, a crisis at the Fed. Uh, and that's just based on base effect. After that, yeah, you should have very rapid disinflation in starting December to February, December 2022 to February 2023, because this is when we had a huge spike in oil prices uh, following the Russian invasion. So I think that's what, that's what the Fed honestly is probably pinning its hopes on, is just you just have to wait it out and then it's just like... Phew like an air pocket, right? Because because the uh, the base effect are going to come off of the energy sector. My concern is back then your your core is going to be at like five, you know, 6%, uh, your wages, your rents, all that stuff. I mean, it's already, most of it's actually already there. Um, and I don't think it's going to deflate as quickly as, as, as they expect. So um, I think higher than consensus, higher for longer as well. Um, I think it plays out like the 70s where there were disinflationary um, episodes in the 70s, like um, the recession of 1974, 1975. So you have the old shocks. You have the, the dollar 71, then the old shock 73. Uh, inflation goes to the roof, then oil prices go down as the, as the old shock works out. The Fed cuts. Um, inflation does slow, but it only falls to, by memory, I think around 4%. 4 and then it starts picking back up. And, and I think that, again, we, we are really projecting far. And I, I think one of the hard things, one of the hard things that's difficult of inflation makes projecting harder because you have a higher uncertainty premium. And that, that's something you feel if, if you go to like a Argentina or Venezuela or places that have high inflation, people don't talk. They don't say in five years. They don't say in 10 years, you know, business transaction in five months. So in inflation kind of shorten your, your ability to forecast the future. So here I'm, I'm doing something very risky, uh, which most likely will be proven wrong. Um, but my, 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 one of the risks you can think of is that inflation does slow in, in February, March of 2023. And then the Fed declares victory, kind of like, um, reminds me of George W. Bush in, in 2003, you know, takes over Baghdad and then has this mission accomplished banner and it sits on the, you know, and, and declares victory. And of course, you know, it was not a victory. I think it's, there's a risk that the Fed does the same thing um, and that the inflation genie is not back in the ball and then it comes back with vengeance in, in two to three years, the exact same way it happened in the 70s. And what's your, okay, so higher for longer, higher than expected for longer for inflation. What about yields uh first let's talk about like the fed funds rate or i guess the two-year because they're very related right. as and then uh the 10-year as well sort of i think the terminal rate now on the fed funds mm -hmm. the highest the market thinks the fed can get is perhaps just shy of four percent it, it breached four percent uh last week do you think it, we go above four percent on the fed funds because vincent if i had a dime every time someone told me the fed <laughs> cannot hike the fed cannot hike the market cannot handle four percent rates i would have like ten dollars 
<laughs> and you'd be more in a much better position to to pay your gas bill. Um uh, well um couple thoughts here. Um okay, yes, it's gone up a bit, four percent. I mean, this is the, the euro dollar curve, which kind of indicates the, the big shift um after last week, you know, the 275 basis point back on the table. So this is the orange line really shows you what, what you what we're talking about. Um, and, and sorry for, for viewers, this is the sort of professionals priced in the price of the euro dollar rather than the yield. So if it says like it's a 96.5, that means a 3.5% rate, I believe on three month LIBOR. Yeah. Not Fed funds, three month yeah. LIBOR. Yeah. Yeah. Very, um, very good explanation. Um, so so clearly, big shift, right? We 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 priced more high, higher terminal rate, but uh, so the, the the new line is the orange line, the, the green line is where we were one month ago. Which again, so sorry, it means a higher yield, even though it's lower on the chart. It means a higher yield. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, correct, correct. Yeah, it's it's a hundred minus three month LIBOR. So um, what I would point to is that the the long end is basically the same. So to me, tells me that transitory is not dead. It's just that we redefine we what transitory means. We said it's going to be longer, it's going to be you know deeper, but at the end of the day, it's going to be transitory. Uh, so that narrative hasn't changed, and I think that needs to change. If I'm right about kind of the secular demographic productivity driven inflation, that long end needs to move. Um, the other the other thought I would have on this is. Um, yeah, four percent, but we have eight point five percent inflation. Um, so I cannot think of a single case in history where you got inflation, inflation went out, went out of control, which is where we are today. Inflation is out of control, and then you got back under control without positive real rates. Um, now, does that mean that we have to go all the way to eight percent? Probably not. But the the, the notion that you can stop eight point five percent inflation with a four percent terminal rate is not backed by history anywhere ever. And uh, the third thought that I have going to your, uh, if I had a dime every time someone told me, you know, the, the Fed fund rate is going to go higher. It's not because it's painful that it's not going to happen. Like the, you know, the world doesn't care about your feelings. Uh, <laughs> yes, it will be painful to see, you know, much higher rates. Um, we've seen it already. Um, but that that doesn't mean that prices are going to slow because the the closing price of the Nasdaq is low. Um, to me, again, the, the problem about this inflation is at this point it's mostly labor market. You know, we we have a, a shortage of of of, of workers, um, and that's that's what needs to be solved. Uh, and I think when when I see economists or or strategists looking at the closing price of the NASDAQ or the, the shape of the yield curve or, you know, 30 year mortgage rates. These are, you know, derivative upon derivative of, of inflation. Like this is the, they're not, they're not looking the manifestation of something, but the, I think what you need to look at is, is the labor market. You need to get some slack in the labor market. Uh, and until that happens, I don't care what the shape of the yield curve is. Prices are not going to go down. Yeah, I'm just looking at a chart of year over year inflation during the 2000s and I'm I didn't know this that the peak was July of 2008 at 5.6% 2 months before the collapse of Lehman Brothers. So the, that just goes to show how uh much of a lag it takes for for things to happen. Like the the financial system was, you know, already in great distress a year before the peak of inflation now. So that would mean that you know the the huge the the financial tightening we've seen the the you know some people are very dramatic about the the, the financial tightening about the rise in risk free rates and the, the fall in equity prices. I think that you know it's only been a moderate tightening to be frank. I think we still have quite ways to go, but that just goes to show that you know let's say HYG goes to sixty dollars and uh, 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 triple C corporate spreads are trading at twenty five base uh, twenty five percent. Like that won't take effect. That won't cause deflation for like at least six to twelve months. Do you know what I mean? So, it's it's inflation is baked into the cake, and if if let's yeah. say deflation a deflation cake is going to take many many months, perhaps years to to put into the oven. I I, I agree. I mean, you know, look going back to that 08, I mean, 
remember before that, right? Every meeting for four years, you know, 25 bips, meeting after meeting, you know, all the way from near zero after 9-11 to 5.25 at the peak uh, and still. So yeah, you get hikes every meeting from 2004 to, to late 2007 and then inflation doesn't peak uh, 12 months after the fact. Um, and now here we are, we think that, I think that was the, that's the narrative that the, 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 the bulls, I, I don't like that term, the bulls thing, but whatever, um, it is like, oh, okay, we, we're getting a lot of pain now, but it's going to be short, you know, like basically we front, we front load the hikes, right? We're going to get these huge 75 bips increases, but then it's going to slow. Um, um, that's, again, that's not how it works now. Maybe it's going to be different, maybe, but I, I would like someone to explain to me how that's going to be different. Yes. And there, there are, Vincent, there are a lot of brilliant people who correctly point out, and it took me a while to realize that they were right, that quantitative easing and low rates does not necessarily create inflation. It, it really only stimulates the financial system. And you can, you know, give, uh, you can, you can, put a trillion dollars of bank reserves on JP Morgan's balance sheet, but you can't force them to lend. And they they realize that. But what these people don't realize is that taking away the bank reserves of JP Morgan, can, you can't force JP Morgan to not lend. And bank lending, which has stagnated for over a decade, is off the freaking charts. Tell us about yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. And, no, I mean, uh, we, we had this conversation in, in the last podcast, you know, inflation is inflationary. We, we talked about velocity uh, and, and the Precisely this definition, you know, central bank does not does not create money. Bank commercial banks do. Central banks create bank reserves, and then the banking sector disposes of these bank reserves in, in whatever based on the demand. We really that's at the end of the day, and and it, yes, we we talked about this as a risk uh, that that you know, and I I think that's the psychology of inflation. Again, inflation is inflationary. I, if you see higher prices for a long time, you start changing your behavior. You're like at first, and I think we are right in the middle here. Like, um, at first you, you, you delay, like I, I see it with used cars, like, oh, well, it's not a good time to buy. Uh, prices are crazy. I'm just going to wait for it. So, and, I, and I still see and, and, and feel a lot of that. Okay. By the way, I, I wish, um, a lot of Americans, are st I still, still think, oh, when they hear transitory, they think that prices are going to normalize. And not, not not even the central bankers think that. All that they're saying is going to keep today's prices. Like when you know when they say like it's gonna, like no no no, we're now going back to 2019. Like today's crazy prices are going to be. We we're hoping to just keep them where they are. But I, I think there's this kind of misconception when when central bankers talk about we we're gonna you know control inflation and we're gonna ins, you know ensure price stability. What people hear is like oh this was a weird thing and then it's gonna go back to the way it was before. It's like no no no. We keep to these prices, they just no longer increase. So that's anyway. Um, where was I going? Oh, yes, inflation is inflationary. But so at the beginning, you start to like the beginning of inflation, I think you, you you wait for prices to come down. But if it lasts for a year, and now it's been a year, and right? pretty much a year of, of about three, four percent inflation, you start to to bake that in and, and you have the exact opposite reaction, which is oh. Instead of waiting, I'm going to buy now because it's going to be more expensive six months later. I'm going to I'm going to be ask for my big pay raise now. I'm going to ask my contractor uh, my my um, I'm going to delay my payment to my supplier. I'm going to ask, but I'm going to you know try to invoice faster, and that's that's how inflationary spiral kick in. And yes, you look at um, uh, loan growth; it's very uh, it's finally picking up. Credit card usage also uh, increasing, uh, and again, these are things that the Fed cannot control. Yes. Uh, and and typically this this is how inflationary spiral develop, develop. I mean, I I still think we we have this view that it cannot happen here. Like, I, okay, now people agree that there is inflation, and, you know. And I I feel I'm a lot. I was a lonely voice in the desert a year ago. And now I'm they, but still, still there is a view that inflation is is an emerging. It's a it's a Turkish thing. It's a, it happens in Brazil or in Peru or, you know, serious countries do not have inflation. And it's like, it's like Germany. Aberration. Germany does not have yes. inflation. By the way, we're recording on yes. a day that we, I think we have 33.5% uh, 
producer price index increase uh, in Germany two months in a row on, on June 20th. So, yeah. Oh, but don't you know, Vincent, don't you know, Europe does not have, Europe is deflationary because of demographics. Vincent, don't you know this? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, tell that to the people who are trying to fill up um, gas. But um, yeah, so we have this view that it, it cannot happen here. But, you know, let, let's say you know nothing about the country that I'm talking about. Nothing at all. I just describe a fictional country. And, uh, you know, so in this fictional country, the, the central bank has been, you know, keeping rates at zero for a long time. The government sent, you know, stimulus worth 20% of GDP uh, after asking people to to stay at home for, for many months, creating havoc in global supply chain and all that stuff. Um, and then, you know, inflation finally happens, you know, a year later, as, as would be expected. Uh, but then the central banker in that country told you that inflation actually did not exist and spent a full year denying the reality of that inflation. Then when that reality became undeniable, that central banker told you, don't worry, it's going to be transitory. Then when transitory did not work anymore, um, then they said, oh, it's because of that other foreign actor. That's speculator there is the one who did it not me it's it's bad actors outside um then you have um finally, finally the central banker comes out with the minister of finance and says no no i'm really committed but doesn't say anything real like just 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 repeat oh i'm going to defend my currency and you know price stability is very important to me but doesn't give you anything concrete to you know um um and then and then inflation keeps happening and then the government starts announcing that they're going to send checks to people in order to fight the inflation, which we are seeing in the Netherlands. People are getting, I think, 600 euros uh, one-time payment. Uh, in, uh, in the U.S., we're talking about a uh, uh, gas tax holiday. In, in France, there's a whole um, inflation. So basically, the idea is there's too much inflation. Let's give people money so they can cope with inflation. Uh, or you have uh, you know, some senators that are coming up with price gouging bills and blaming it on speculators. Uh, this to me feels very Brazilian or Turkish. Uh, so why are we so sure that, you know, if we do the exact same thing as the Turks or the Brazilians, we will have a different outcome. Like why are we completely still excluding the possibility that we have double digit inflation in the U S in the next two years? I mean, this is nowhere in no swap charts, no yield curve. You, you, you cannot find that, but, if you look at it objectively, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think there's a huge, there's a large probability that it does happen because the policy reaction to this inflationary shock has been um, pretty much Latin American populist, you know, blame it on foreigners, deny it, uh, call it transitory, uh, and then uh, respond to it by making the problem worse. Like, oh, you know, I'm going to tax all companies because it makes too much money, or I'm going to give people checks so they can buy more oil because there's an oil shortage. I mean, the level of, I don't know, economic illiteracy that I see is, is not that different from what you would see in, in a standard emerging country facing a balance of payment crisis. And to, to your point uh, about saying, oh, we're not as bad as Brazil, oh, we actually are. I'd say at least Brazil, the Bank of Brazil has, has raised its rates to, what, 13%. The U.S. is still at 1.5%, and the highest the market is implying we'll get to is 4%. And that's, well, you know, that's not even half of what inflation is now. And the U.S., the Fed, is by far the most hawkish central bank uh, in, in the d developed world. ECB, way behind the curve, not even trying. Bank of Japan is in la-la land. Their currency is, is you know, going is going bananas um vincent i guess let's let's give some folks some actionable trades you have a uh, five and by the way vincent i didn't i didn't actually introduce you um in, in my introduction i should have you're the the head of global macro at stone x and i think your reports and your writing are my favorite to read you know i do read a lot of these reports uh you, you i'd say you are a fantastic writer uh with a very compelling and interesting uh, um, anecdotes and comparisons to literature and, and stories across across time. For example, I'm, uh, you know, opening up one, and you 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 have a story about a grasshopper, the short-lived summer of the European grasshopper, and you also happen to be very right, uh, especially over the, over the past year. Um, so, folks, if they can, should definitely uh, check check your work out. Um, the five five inflation trades, uh, which stands out to you? I guess what, what which ones do you want to talk about? 
Well, the, the first one to me is probably the, the more interesting because it's, I, I can't wrap my head around it. It's, uh, it's very simple. It's the idea is, and it's, so let me explain the train. Uh, the, the trade is um, you have this huge backwardation in the oil market, meaning that if you buy oil in, in six months, it's cheaper than it is today. In 12 months, it's even cheaper and, and, and so forth. Uh, so at the time when I was writing the report, and I don't know how these numbers have changed, but you could buy oil in three years at a 30% discount. So you just go along an oil future in you know uh, 2025. You know, if spot was 100, you could get it at 70. Uh, that's, that's what the price is was when I wrote the report. Um, now, if you did the same thing with a CPI swap, um, and that's gone up quite a bit, I'm sure, the market was pricing, you know, you'd have about 5% average inflation over the past three years. And, and when, I, when I look at these two numbers, I one of them has to be wrong. Uh, either we'll have $70 oil in 2025, or uh, we'll have... Um, you know, 5% inflation, but we cannot have them both. If, if oil, if oil does fall, the CPI will follow. Uh, I mean, if you look at the correlation between oil prices and the CPI, it's, it's extraordinarily high. Um, so the idea was you, you go, you buy the cheap stuff, sell the expensive stuff. So you will go long oil, uh, in the futures market, three year old contract. And then against that, you'd sell an inflation swap for the same tenor, the same maturity. Um, so that way, what you were really betting is, is that, um, I mean, in my view, both, both, both of these things will go up, oil prices will go up, inflation will go up, uh, but you're really betting on a mispricing between the two. Um, and, and I think it really speaks to the, uh, the different nature of, of the futures market for, for oil and, and CPI. So, you know, for the oil market, the, 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 the futures market is an inventory manage management tool, basically. Uh, the, 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 the shape of the future curve gives incentive to producers uh, and refiners to move production back and forth in time. So now we have this very tight market because of the Russian invasion, uh, because of very strong demand, because of OPEC not supplying. So there's a huge premium for spot delivery. And as a result, you have a backward curve. So that's really what it means. It doesn't mean that the market expects that oil price is going to fall to $70 in three years. I, I doubt that this is the case. It's just, just reflects that things are tight right now. Conversely, if you get a, the swap market, it's a pure financial investment. So it does reflect just expectation. So I think that's the reason why this mispricing exists is because the two curves do different things. And as an investor, you can probably, um, uh, and I think that the smart way to put an inflation trade without getting whipsawed if, you know, something unexpected happens. Vincent, I've got a question. So mm -hmm. the dotted blue line is oil futures. That's in backwardation. That makes sense. On the left side, you know, now it's 110, but in three years, it's going to be 70. That makes sense. But why would you have an upward sloping CPI curve? And this would be on the right side, priced in basis points. So 330 mm -hmm. basis points would be 3.3%. I thought that the uh, inflation curve was downward sloping as as it is in, is in here, know, right? I'm talking level here. Correct, correct. Like the 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 the, the 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 inflation is a rate of change, right? I'm talking the CPI, the actual index. Ah, okay, okay, yes. Okay, so the what the CPI market tells you that the price level in three years. I'm I'm, I'm I don't know the number as of today, uh, but I think it was around four percent when I wrote the report. So it the a four year a three year inflation swap was at 4% CPI, meaning that the, the price level, the, the consumer price index is going to be about 12% higher in three years than it is now. So, okay, okay price level sense. is going to be 12% higher. Oil price is going to be 30% lower. One of these things is not right. For me, it's it's the oil price that's more wrong, but you know, the, the point is you can buy a contract on both of these things right now and, and, and bet on the convergence of these two prices. And so for you to be wrong in this trade, Vincent, what would have to happen? That would be oil would have to go up a, uh, oil, oil would have to go down a lot. No, I'm, I'm, I'm long oil, yeah. Yeah. Oil would have to go down a lot, but CPI would still go up a lot. So what, that'd be rent or, so the secular stuff would still go up. Correct. 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 Yeah. Correct. But again, I, even I, an inflation bull and all that stuff, like 
if we do have $70 oil prices, <laughs> it's going to be deflationary. So yeah, Vincent, tell us what are we seeing here? So what we're seeing is the, uh, the actual uh, price of the two instruments that I was mentioning before, meaning the, the three-year change in the price level, this is the three-year cha three change in oil prices, and you can see the correlation is extraordinarily high. Uh, when the, It's about 85% when the market is actually telling us that these two things will diverge. One will go down by 30%, the other one will go up by 12%. My point is that it's never happened before, uh, and I don't think it's going to happen in the future again. Right. I I guess the only scenario in which you would be wrong would be something where, you know, there, there's a huge change in the supply uh, of oil and natural gas. Uh, thank God, you know, the, the, the war in Russia. Co correct. Ukraine, like, 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 like uh, end of the war, end of the war in Ukraine. And then on the non-energy inflation side, you're so right about the demographics and everything that that's really inflationary. So so the CPI would go up a lot. Yes. Um, do you, let's see, one other trade. Tell us, yeah, tell us about the BOJ. Tell us about your long yen short Nikkei position. Well, that, that is, um, that is a pretty crazy one, a, a risky one, but I, I mean, I feel like at some point something has to happen in Japan. Like they, they can't keep this thing going. Um, as you were mentioning before, Japan is the odd man out, right? I mean, the entire world is, is hiking, uh, and then the BOJ just keeps that that forward guidance um, and then this uh, yield curve. I said it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, the caps the yield on on JGBs at uh, at uh, twenty five basis points. Um, and when they do that, effectively, they're, uh, I would argue, destroying the Japanese economy, manufacturing sector. I mean, you have like, you know, 30, 40% PPI in Japan at this point. And yes, there's still very little inflation in Japan, right? It's about 2%, something. So PPI, producer price rise by 35%, consumer price rise by 2%. What does that tell you about margin? Just complete squeeze. And keep in mind that Japan operates in kind of traditional economy stuff, like they're very, you know, manufacturing heavy, um, automotive. Uh, so it's not like they have this huge margin to start with. So I don't think they can absorb this price shock, especially when the yen is falling by 10% every month. Um, so my idea is that at some point there will be tremendous amount of pressure from the business sector. And in Japan, it's very... Um, the relation between the, the government business sector is very tight um, to stop. Um, and when that happens, I think that there will be one day, I, I don't know what day that will be, um, but there will be one day where the BOJ will come up and say, okay, we are no longer defending the JGBs. Let the price let the price be what what the market wants it to be, which would be very difficult because they are they there are entire days when no JG there's no private transaction in JGBs for like many many days. So it's it's at this point it's an administered market that the BOJ does all the buying. There's no other, and I think at some point it will step out, um, and then on, when that happens, you will see the the mother of all uh, short squeezes on the yen. Uh, the yen will just go for the roof. My 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 example would would be the. Uh, what happened on the Swiss central bank about seven years ago, 2015, they, 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 they targeted a peg to the euro and they had kept it for many, many years. And then one morning they said, okay, we can't do this anymore. And then the Swiss franc jumped by like 25%. I think back then it was a 96 standard deviation move based on what the, the, the euro Swiss franc was. I think the same thing will happen to the yen. So you have the yen will shoot up and, um, and the Nikkei will plunge. Um, so, I know it's a very uh, it's a very painful trade to hold because right now you're losing on both hand, on, on both legs. But at some point, long yen short Nikkei is going to be on one day make you fabulously rich if you can hold it and right. take the pain until it happens. Right. So the the Bank of Japan is keeping a bond uh, Japanese bond yields artificially low so the the valve the pressure has to go through the the currency valve so the JPY Japanese yen is depreciating against the dollar over the past year we've had you, you know the dollar yen go from 110 to 135 so i want to be clear short your your trade is short the Japanese yen but don't short the Japanese yen and buy Japanese government bonds with them just hold the yen right no, no, so i'm saying long the yen short the Nikkei yes 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 
wonderful. I, I actually do have a final question, which is psychological advice for people that have nailed this market. So you've absolutely nailed this market, Vincent. You know, at the risk of sounding immodest, like the, a lot of the guests who I've had on have nailed the market, maybe not as much as you, but you know, we've kind of like people like Joseph Wang, Michael Howell have sort of been called that inflation is going to go up and bonds and stocks are going to sell off together. Um, you know, I in sort of like trading my personal account, like you know, things I've been very fortunate. Like, what advice would you say? And you know, it's my hope that folks who watch this uh, podcast have at least saved money, if not made money. Um, what would you say? That, but here's the thing: what would you say to stop people from being arrogant just because they've been right? Uh, or we're being overconfident just because they've been right for the past year does not mean that they will be right for the next year. For example, you know, a year and a half ago, someone who invested in the lowest quality, most speculative companies would have been right. And the more speculative, the lower quality, the better they would have done in returns. And folks who were shorting or on or were uh, questioning and cynical, they were not doing well. Clearly, we're in a different world. Um, so just as those folks, you know, they were right for a year and now they're definitely not right. What would you say, you know, psychological advice you'd give as well as perhaps like a, a heuristic for how to how to tell if you're wrong? Like, oh, the energy stocks I'm invested in are down 20 percent. Like it's time for me to actually, you know, pour cold water in my face and take my loss rather than clinging to a narrative. That's an excellent question. Um, one thing that comes to mind, I think, is, is expectations. And, and I think one of the things that the, the, the bubble did is it it really screwed up in people's heads. Um, you know, this, this quote, I think that like Kindleberger, they, there's nothing as disturbing to one's um, mental health as the sight of a neighbor getting rich very quickly. Um, and I think we saw a lot of that with the, the crypto, the SPAC, the, the stonks, the NFTs. Like, you know, I, I've had friends, you know, ask me, uh, how do I double my money in the next two months? And my answer is you don't. You don't. I mean, any, anyone who tells you you can double your money in, in two months is, is selling you a pipe dream. Um, and, and that was clearly a problem, in, in, I think, in our generation. Um, uh, and that's something that also we must keep in mind um, that um, we're going to, you can be right on the macro stuff and still lose money. Um, for example, one thing that hasn't worked for me is, is precious metals. Um, very, I mean, it hasn't gone poorly, but it hasn't done much. You know, gold is at, you know, 1850 and, you know, hasn't moved for two years. Um, and that's okay. That's okay. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, we had this very deluded view that we, you know, financial markets are not there to double your money every two months. Uh, it's a long game. And you're, you're there to survive uh, and, and not to lose money um, or too much money. Um, so I'm sure in the next, you know, two to three years, there will be uh, really bad hiccups along the way. Um, on the energy stuff, I mean, just, you know, I haven't checked today, but, you know, Friday, energy prices got, got clubbed, but there will be more of these days. Um, and I think it's, it's being comfortable, the idea of, of, you know, not being right all the time and, and occasionally losing money, uh, which again is something that we haven't been accustomed to because we had such a favorable environment. Like if you look at your 60, 40 portfolio for, with the exception of 08, it was pretty much in 2018 as well. I mean, but two years, but for four years, it was up every year. <laughs> um, and most of these years, it was like eight to 9%, like, like a clock. I think we are moving to a, a much harder environment. Uh, where uh, even if you're right, you can you can lose money, uh, yeah. and I would say a psychological aspect: don't don't beat yourself about it. Um, you know, it's going to be volatile. Uh, there's going to be market dislocation, um, and um, you know, make sure you you don't use too much leverage. Uh, you can afford to lose uh, what you have at play, and if the market moves against you, don't don't take it personally either way. Like. If it's going with you, don't think you're anything special and, you know, that the hubris falls, but that also works the other way. Like if it's going against you, it could be that, you know, there will be setbacks on the way. Yeah, right. And yeah, in my personal account, I've been you know shorting a lot of individual stocks. And I'll say the the juice there, I think it, it might be, it's been very good, obviously, but it might be close to being over. And like some of the stocks that have gone down the most like 90%, they now have more cash on their balance sheet than the equity 
market capitalization. They have no debt. And yes, the CEO is like my age and, you know, probably a <laughs> criminal. Yes. But it's still, you know, it's maybe not, it's maybe not a wise idea. To, it's maybe a wise idea to cover your short. If you're short, like that could rally a hundred percent. And so what's your sort of risk reward? You're, you're, with uh, when you're shorting something, yes. you're, you're short vol- your long volatility, yes, but you are short convexity. Um, so definitely, you know, maybe it's time to like degross, degross the book. And you know, I, I rarely give sort of, I never give investment advice, but I rarely even talk about stuff like this. But uh, you know, we're 90 minutes in, and you know, why not? Um, we don't have any time to talk about Europe. You've got a great report about Europe, but what is the uh, what is the story of the grasshopper in the winter? Can you just tell us that? That's an analogy for for Europe. Uh, it's a, a, a little tale by Aesop. Uh, there's a, a grasshopper who's kind of like partying and singing in summer and she's happy. And and the ant, on the other hand, is kind of working and storing food the winter. And the winter comes, the the, gra- the grasshopper is, is freezing and starving, comes to the ant's house and asks for hospitality. And the ant is like, well, you know, why don't you go out and dance? Um, I feel like, you know, there's a little bit of that for, for Europe. Um, up until the the past week, Europe was outperforming, you know, I was in France for the past two weeks. Uh, you know, there was a sense that things were somewhat back to normal, you know, the the Jubilee psychologically, you know, we saw the Queen, it was a nice moment, people were going out, summer vacation in France always feels f- fantastic, lots, you know, people just wanted to kind of enjoy, uh, um, enjoy their time, there's the view that, you know, the, you know, the, the Russia war has made Europe more you know, stronger. Uh, there was some optimism that came out of the Macron re-election. And, and my view is that these things are somewhat illusory. And we are seeing these things as we speak, right? I mean, the, I don't know if you followed the parliamentary elections in France, but, you know, the popularity of Macron was somewhat of an illusion. People just didn't like the other option, but there was certainly no um, embrace of his policies or, or program. Um, so I think the, yeah, the, 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 the outperformance of European indices is, is somewhat unlikely to last. And, and when the winter comes, we'll still have the same issues we had before, which is our dependency on, on, on Russian natural gas. Um, and, 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 and the fact, which I think is relevant for the US, uh, and maybe you can finish on that. In the US, we kind of had this view of, of uh, either or when it comes to recession or inflation. There's a view that you know if we have a recession, inflation will go away. What you see in Europe, tells you that you can have both. I mean, I, I think Europe is in a recession right now, at least, you know, Germany probably is. France may be a little bit better, but as a whole, Europe, you know, GDP growth in Europe is likely going to be negative this year. Uh, and still, we have the exact same inflation as we do in the US. So, which is one of the reasons why I get frustrated with this recession debate. And I, I don't want to take a strong stance because what does it matter? If inflation is at still at 8.5%, does it matter what real GDP is? Absolutely not, because the central bank needs to focus on inflation. And I think that's that's the part that the Americans still haven't understood that they can have inflation and recession at the same time. All right. I promise you this is my final question. I promise. Okay. So if you have inflation, you want to be short long-term bonds, short TLT. If we have a recession, you want to be long TLT. You want to be long those bonds. If you have an inflationary recession, where is the long-term bond yield? What happens there? Well, um, I I would just dodge the question altogether and go short credit, high yield credit. That's it, right? Because you get both both of these things work for you, right? Mm. Uh, you know, the, the inflationary bit uh, means that you know duration is a risk, and then the recessionary bit means that credit is a risk. So I think that's that's the instrument to trade. A, and you a, still think a that's a good trade? So like, if you had put on that trade over the past six months, it would be a phenomenally, a ridiculously good trade. But you still think it's a good trade? I, I think so too. I mean, it's. Um, it's the beginning of the end. No, no, sorry. It's, sorry, it's the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. There we go. Wonderful. Vincent, it's been an absolute pleasure having you back on Forward Guidance. Uh, you, more than anyone I know, has absolutely nailed it. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, let's see, on Twitter, as well as where can people find your work, which I recommend they definitely do. Well, thanks, Jack. Um, so Twitter is fantastic. Um, so my handle is at Vincent Deluard, Vincent, V-E-I-N-C-E-N-T, Deluard, D-E-L-U-A-R-D. Um, if you go to my pin tweet, uh, there is a link uh, to a, a page where you can register for a free trial of the research. Uh, we grant 100% of these requests, um, you know, if, or you can just simply DM me and I'll, I'll take it with you. I generally try to answer everybody on, on Twitter. 
I, I find that I get a lot of, of smart ideas. I get to interact with a lot of, of people from all walks of life on Twitter. Uh, and then if you if you happen to uh, trade with Sonex, um, you know, a very large uh, broker dealer with Fortune 100 company, um, well, uh, contact your rep, uh, ask if you can be put on my distribution list and we'll work something out. Uh, and um, that's that's pretty much it. And try you can follow me. I, I try to do as, as many of these uh, podcasts as I can. I think it's really fantastic that, I mean, that we have, you know, tools to learn about markets. It's, it's, it's really fantastic. Like the, you can speak to this or hear the smartest people talk and give you trade ideas. I mean, if you want to educate yourself, I think places like, like forward guidance, uh, like, like the work that Blockworks do is, is really fantastic for retail investors. It's, it's changed the game. Uh, you have access to the best mind of finance in real time. Uh, and it's a fantastic tool to educate yourself. So thanks, Jack. That's very kind of you, Vincent Delaward. Everyone, please follow him on Twitter. Let's get him to 10,000 followers. You're, you're 50 away. Uh, <laughs> Vincent, thank you so much. <laughs> thanks, Jack. Take care. Take care. There is something that you need to be doing right now, and that is reading the BlockWorks Daily newsletter. For top market insights and the latest in crypto news, you have to subscribe to the BlockWorks Daily newsletter, and you can do so by clicking on the link in the description to this video or by visiting blockworks.co forward slash newsletter.